welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Ocean TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on today's episode, we're going to look at some headlines, talk about some things we've been listening to. I'll showcase a few new CDs that have been released and talk about something that we never talk about, which is in the print and publishing world, because something new just happened. And it could be really significant for the future for film music fans all over the place. So we'll talk about, we'll elaborate on what I'm talking about nice very, tease. very soon. <laughs> Um, all right, so first up, uh, Thomas Newman. It's got a new project. It's going to involve a Pixar film called The Good Dinosaur. So uh, check that out. Any Pixar fans, this time is not Randy Newman, but will be the cousin instead. Um, next up, Patrick Doyle uh, releases a new album called The Impressions of America. And Kevin, you read a little bit about this. Is that right? Yeah, it's essentially um, like an orchestral concert piece. It's not It's not a symphony or anything. It's a full-length CD. It's 15 short movements each one is like a different musical postcard so to speak from different parts of america um and the longest movement i think is about four minutes so it's just tiny little musical vignettes it comes out in a couple of weeks um so it should be interesting to look at i don't think this is the first time that patrick doyle has done um a release of of concert music like this but it's certainly not something that happens super often so uh, it should be worth checking out i think cool all right um, Hans Zimmer, just as a quick mention, because we'll come back to his name in a moment, uh, he was honored at the Idlewild Arts Gala on April 14th, so congrats, Hans, for that. Uh, there is an interview with Danny Elfman about his new score for Oz uh, at Den of Geek. Again, all these links you could find at our website, uh, soundnotion.tv slash SAP. Uh, Kevin, did you have a chance to check out a little bit of that interview? I did not. Oh, okay. So anyway, mm-hmm. for anybody that... Because we are so prepared. For those of you that aren't slackers. (laughs) So if you want to read more about it, go check out. We'll have the link at our website. It's awesome. There you go. Uh, Next up, um, there's a cool video I found where a composer named Yoav Gorin. I know I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, so apologies, Yoav or Yoav. uh, He explains how movie trailers get scored. And I've got a link to it, so you can watch this it's sort of, uh, I want to say, nine, ten-minute YouTube video, but kind of interesting and insightful. Of course, one of the told-you-so moments was when he explains how they have to do quick uh, mock-ups uh, very, very, very quickly, and often they'll want the largest, most dramatic sound uh, for every trailer, especially large tentpole summer comic book action-adventure movies. So you got to have choir. And there's sort of a little, as just a little anecdote, after watching the video, they have a, a moment where they try to use samples and they explain how it's just not enough. It's just not realistic enough. And so it's sort of like a I told you so moment. And they talk about how they actually end up just going and hiring a real choir. So when it's all over with, I, I'm at least thankful that they discovered that on their own <laughs> and, and started using like a real choir and actual real instruments. But, but, uh, these uh, uh, him and his uh, some of his composing partners are responsible for the way trailer music is and sometimes why you don't always hear that music in the finished movie itself and why other times that maybe the trailer music is more memorable than what you actually end up hearing. So very fascinating and um, kind of almost like a new pocket industry that yeah. all and, yeah on and a tangent. I know of a lot of younger composers too who are really kind of drawn to that. Like some people who sure well, that's what they want to do specifically is write music for movie trailers. Um, and so that seems, like you said, kind of an, in- an interesting little industry that is um, growing you know, very much like video game music, which is now a very large industry. Um, it's kind of sprouting up. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, since most uh, big budget movies – have a movie trailer that's about two and a half minutes. And I've even heard rumors that the new man of steel third trailer that will come out soon, maybe sometime in April will be three minutes. So notice I'm holding three because it's the third trailer and it'll be a three full minutes long. So it's has two meanings. Three has yeah. two. Meanings. Right, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This so is good radio. Yeah, yeah. This is quality right here. Um, so uh, for that reason, it's about the length of a song. So if you are used to writing in small structure and kind of polishing that, you know, with samples and, and effects and good recording techniques, then that could be actually like really a lot of fun and rewarding. And so anyway, rock on. And so check out that video on how movie trailers get scored. Um, next up, 
uh, Giacchino is now finishing up with the Star Trek Into Darkness score. So the movie will come out on May, I believe, May 17th. Uh, I'm excited for it. I hope it's good. I, I really definitely want to see it. And uh, he's got about four little little videos from recorded from, it looks like just from his phone, from inside yeah. the recording studio. And so you can see through the glass, you can see the orchestra on the other side. And you can hear, uh, especially for any, you know, any of our uh, listeners and watchers who are familiar with Giacchino's first score to the Star Trek film from 2009, you can hear the similarities and you can hear like the end credit suite where he takes the original Alexander Courage uh, tune and he um, dialogues it with his new tune. And so that's still there. That component, he brings it back. But then, well, interestingly enough, uh, there was like three or four videos, like I mentioned. I listened to all three of them, or all, however many, and one of them just had almost a straight-up modern rendition of the old-fashioned Star Trek theme. And it was mm -hmm. kind of interesting because the first movie, to my memory, never gave us that. It was always connected to his. And right. so right. Um, so anyway, there was that. And then his big theme from his Star Trek movie of 09 is brought yeah. back as well, um, which I yeah. could in, in I, those videos. I can do without videos, at this point. You can but, hear – in those videos, you can hear a lot of our producer Dave's favorite uh, favorite tune from that score. Um, in addition to the videos, Giacchino had been um, he tweeted like some photos of some score pages and things like that. So it's kind of interesting that he is bringing his Twitter followers into the recording process a little bit. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, and also you see uh, he'll show all the people in the room, so you can like. He'll turn right around and there's J.J. Abrams right there, like giving a thumbs up. And then he's got like his music editor and all his other recording engineers. It's just kind of cool to be reminded that it, none of this stuff is ever really truly done by one person anymore. Um, it's it's a team effort to make sure it all sounds good and works really well by the end. So anyway, very cool. Check that out if you get a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, now, finally, uh, it's not so much a news story as it is something I want to actually share in its entirety. So I, I'm a huge Superman fan, and I'm really eagerly awaiting The Man of Steel. And so, any course, of course, any news that comes out, I want to read all about it, but I'm trying to be very careful about spoilers and and about, um, like, lately the Entertainment Weekly article came out with a bunch of photos, and supposedly there's some spoilers. I'm trying to avoid all of that. But this article came out within the last week, and it had a, a whole uh, section interviewing Hans Zimmer, or actually, it was just an article. It was just an interview with Hans Zimmer about the score, and they were just asking him like, uh, "What's your approach?" And and I'm not I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just trying to be objective and present just the things he said. But I just want to simply do that. So I want to read a few of the quotes that uh, that he mentions uh, in regards to the score. So here's the first one. So this is sort of at the outset. So he says. Uh, the, about regarding the trepidation of taking on the job of writing music for a, a Superman movie, he says, quote, look, that was daunting. Seriously, he's the greatest film composer out there. Uh, he's referring to John Williams here. Uh, without a doubt, and it happens to be one of his iconic pieces of music, so I spent three months just procrastinating and not even getting a start on the thing because I was so intimidated. Oh, my God, I'm following in John Williams' footsteps, end quote. All right, so that's the setup. That's the I'm, you know... I'm humble before ye or, or whatever, kind of <laughs> get that out there. Uh, then they asked him uh, about like the sound what he was going to, you know, what he was going to use and what, what kind of things he wanted to hear in the score. So then he says next, quote, what was important for Superman was the simple fact that none of us pay much attention to the Midwest. I know America mainly by the big cities, but if you go into the Midwest, there's a, there is a people there and there is a country there. And I thought it was important that the decent folk, simple folk, be the heart of the story. And a character who is guileless, who isn't complicated in the sort of flawed way our Dark Knight is, and isn't political in any way. He's just striving to become a better part of humanity. And that, end quote. So that sets up for the next thing, uh, which is the specifics about the score. And then he adds, and this is the final quote, uh, sonically, this treatment of America comes across via a grouping of pedal steel guitars instead of the usual string section, banging titanium and steel sculptures, and organizing a who's who of drummers in a 12-member drum circle, including Jason Bonham, Sheila E., and Farrell Williams. The great thing about Superman is that everybody loves Superman, Zimmer said with a laugh. It's very easy making the call and saying, hey, can you come? I remember phoning Farrell and him saying, I'm right in the middle of producing the Beyonce album in Miami. 
Jason Bonham's in Miami, and he's getting on a plane. Next morning, there's Farrell looking a little blurry-eyed, end quote. So let me specify, though, that that was a quote from the article, which itself quoted Zimmer. And so that was everything I was reading just now to avoid any confusion. It was the article and Zimmer in that in that one big quote. But it's I just find it interesting that he's kind of saying, hey, when I think Superman now, I'm thinking of steel string guitars and a 12-member drum circle and and maybe replacing the usual strings. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to kind of put that out there right now and say it. that's the clues we've been given and that I still want to hear what he comes up with. But, um, Kevin, are your first thoughts, um, oh, no, or I'm curious what this will end up being I, like? I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily I, – I, yeah, I, I think I'm curious to, to see what it will mean. You know, he mentions – this kind of small town middle America sort of approach. And to me, and I think to probably a lot of people, you know, my, my first thought is kind of that Copeland Americana style, which is essentially what John Williams did. And it sounds like that's exactly what Hans Zimmer is, is maybe trying to avoid. So maybe it'll, it'll be interesting to see how he goes after that kind of small town Americana style without heading in that Copeland Williams Direction. So that's that's kind of what I'm curious to see. Um, well, I mean, to heroic Superman stuff. Yeah, that that will just kind of remains to be seen, no matter what. Yeah, I think I think maybe several decades back, when um, orchestral music, if you could even say this, was a little bit on the public's mind. You know, maybe Disney's Fantasia or music behind Judy Garland and The Wizard of Oz or things like that. You know, especially around World War II in the 50s and 60s, when the general population is more familiar with orchestral music, they may have actually thought more of like Copeland and Appalachian Spring. And so John Williams definitely tapped into that for all the scenes with Smallville in the 1978 movie. Um, And then, of course, the music style changes once Clark Kent goes to the city and becomes grown up and becomes Superman. But um, nowadays, when you think of uh, like the country... I think most people think of like country music now. I don't think they're. I don't think the orchestra is on anyone's mind. So, Copeland's Appalachian Spring, or even Billy the Kid, or Rodeo, or any of that. I don't think that's on anybody's ears or or mind. And so, I wonder if Zimmer is trying to essentially say that I want this almost folksy, maybe even like twangy guitar for everything in Smallville. So everything where Clark is wandering around trying to find himself is going to be accompanied by guitarists and so that's yeah. what made me curious sure. yeah that, that makes sense I, I think that's a very good theory yeah absolutely well we'll see um because like folksy nowadays can mean just simply bring in a guitar and it'll be like solo guitar and then if we want to make it sound like more significant we'll put a bed of strings behind it but um we'll we'll see how it turns out i think maybe the drumming could just be simply when general zod arrives and everything hits the fan and then you've got lots of action. So yeah, it could be too. Yeah. We could see, it could be like, yeah, it could be a mixture. Um, but I, I mean, knowing Zimmer, I'm sure there's, there's strings in there as well. There, I mean, he, you need the, the, the normal sort of conventions of film scoring, I think to, to have some place, unless he's just really literally going to throw it all out and sort of build this up from scratch. And then that would be a pretty bold choice. So sure. that would certainly, I'm sure he probably has 19 play. bass trombones in there somewhere. <laughs> that it's possible. So anyway, um, the link to the article is on our website again. So if you're interested at all, check this out. And I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts on it, what you think it might mean. And do you feel it's good or bad? Because should this movie try to distance itself in every way? Or should, since it's produced by Nolan, Christopher Nolan, should it have any kind of similarities whatsoever to the Dark Knight trilogy? So I'll let, you know, I'll let the viewers think about that kind of stuff. But Kind of interesting, and it's exciting because it's only t- like ten weeks away, like nine or ten weeks away, and then we'll get the movie, and then all speculating is is done. Yeah, who, so who, who's counting, right, Bill? Yeah, really. I mean, I don't know, like nine weeks and seven days. No. Anyway, um, okay, so <laughs> ten weeks. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm I'm the mathematician, but I think that's about ten weeks. Uh, it's like twenty three hours and fifty nine minutes. What's the difference? <laughs> um, but anyway. Uh, we've been listening to some things lately. Uh, I've had a chance to see a few things, but I wanted to ask Kevin first. Kevin, yeah. firstly, what have you been watching or listening to this week? 
Um, you know, really the only thing I've checked out recently was the uh, the re-release of Jurassic Park and IMAX 3D, which was pretty, mm-hmm. pretty spectacular. Yeah. Um, and of course, the the score shined through just as well as um, the 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 twenty year old special effects, which still look pretty pretty convincing. They're still great. Yeah. Disclaimer: I saw it along with Kevin too, so I loved it. It was great. You know, and there was a couple scenes in that film. And that's the kind of in-depth analysis that the the people tune into streamers and punches for. That's right. (laughs) I liked it. It was great. How are you going to know it's great? Kevin, what was your favorite part? (laughs) Oh, please. That's that's what I call drilling down. (laughs) When the the T-Rex climbs over the fence is my favorite part. Kevin's, what's yours? And you can't pick mine because I already picked it. (laughs) You know what? And, and honestly, and, and you know, and I think most film music fans will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the journey to the island when the helicopter shows up flying over the horizon heading towards the mountains. Because that's like the best musical moment in the whole score. Well, that's a pretty good moment. But I was telling my class the other day, one of the great things about that film from a scoring standpoint is that if you get too caught up in the themes, then you miss the actual scoring music when – the whole point of the film is that at first everything's optimistic and it's like, what could go wrong with dinosaurs and technology together? But then everything starts to unravel and that's when the when everything hits the fan in this story. And that's when I think it's at its most awesome. And the music, likewise, you get a very Bartok and Stravinsky influence that comes yeah. over everything. And so all the music of the raptors are in the kitchen and they're chasing them around. It's It's fantastic. I love it. Um, and and I, we should mention that in in sort of honor of this IMAX re-release and the 20th anniversary and the Blu-rays and all that kind of stuff, um, they've re-released uh, the soundtrack, which now includes four extra tracks uh, as well. Um, that's so right. That weren't on the original CD, so you can go and, and check those out. Definitely, definitely. Um, that's that's about it. I mean, the score is is great. It's it's Williams and Spielberg, where Spielberg kind of just lets you know, John Williams write about whatever he wants. And so there's just a lot of flourish to the score uh, or flourish. Um, and in some cases, you, you can tell the music editor and the supervisor have to turn it down a little just to get everything else to come out okay, like sound effects and dialogue. There's just a lot there musically, but it's it's very well scored and it it's, has some of the best sort of musical hits or just moments of musical emphasis on the action that you see on the screen. Like I said, especially once everything starts going badly for the humans, it's mm-hmm. some of the most exciting musical moments. And and then the themes are are you know they're nice, but I think the like running, chasing, oh no, I don't want to get eaten music is is some of the the most fun. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I did have a chance to check out this the Oz movie, the Great and Powerful, or Oz the Great and Powerful, with uh, Franco, James Franco, Mila Kunis, Rachel Weisz, and uh, Michelle Williams. And actually, I saw that with our producer, Dave, because Dave lost a bet and uh, had to take me. No, I'm kidding. But we both saw it. And while the thoughts are kind of mixed on the film itself, I felt the score was was decent enough. It supported the film. It supported the action. Uh, after a while, the movie, sort of the spectacle of it is is distracting enough. And I suppose as a credit to Elfman, I wasn't really paying attention to the score later in the film during all the climactic moments because... The actual score was was assisting the movie in being dramatic enough and holding my attention. So that's sort of a a, a non compliment compliment towards Danny Elfman on that. So uh, it, it was effective for what it was. Yeah. Um, I had a chance to check out the Total Recall remake that came out last summer because I did miss it in theaters. Uh, the one with Colin Farrell and Jessica Biel and Kate Beckinsale, uh, Brian um, Brian. Uh, uh, Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston uh, is also in it in a smaller role. Uh, not bad. I mean, more like a straightforward action movie. It tried to do a couple different things than the original Total Recall. But I believe my guess is that both of which still aren't adapting the original Philip K. Dick story all that well. That would be my guess. But anybody who's read it, chime in. I want to know. So that's your assignment, America. Tell me the difference between Total Recall the book and Total Recall the movie. And I know the book's not called Total Recall. Heaven forbid you read the book yourself. I, mean, I know. Well, I, I could, absurd. but I'm so busy doing research for streamers and punches. <laughs> well, <laughs> that I just it, don't. It shows. It really. Does. I know, doesn't it? 
that no, but um, we can remember it for you wholesale as the title of the original book. But anyway, um, but the score. So that's what I wanted to get to. The score. Um, unfortunately, I found it just to be really generic. I mean, a lot of percussion, a lot of drums. It was composed by uh, Harry Gregson Williams. And sometimes I, I have felt in the past that there's a kind of a generic quality with some of the, the media ventures slash remote control composers. And the, I, I did not hear anything memorable or anything beyond the fact that it's a serviceable score. And when there's action on screen, there's action in the drumming in the soundtrack. And that was about it. I, I it was like pads and layers and textures. So, uh, Maybe a wasted opportunity, but maybe he was just arguably just doing his job and just supplying all they asked for, and they they obviously liked it. They didn't throw it out. But anyway, not memorable for any other reason, and certainly pales in comparison to the original Jerry Goldsmith score, but that's on another level. So anyway, um, the final thing is that I started watching The Homeland, the Showtime series that has Claire Danes and Damian Lewis, and um, I don't want to get into the whole description of the show, but it's uh, it's done fairly well. And the music is composed by Sean Callery, uh, most often associated or most well-known from 24. And it's interesting because the character of Claire Danes has an affinity for jazz music. And so it's a it's sort of a running theme, it, or it has been through a couple episodes, but it, it manifests uh, the most in the main title of the show. There's sort of an overlapping of dialogue and a little bit of sound effects, but then Sean Callery's music, so it, there's like a... It's like a montage effect of dialogue, sound effects, and music for the opening credits. But it's fairly cool. It's fairly effective and, and kind of refreshing um, because it's not normally what you'd hear. But it's interesting because of the jazz element. There's a solo trumpet that kind of just sails over everything. And after having watched the Kevin Spacey uh, House of Cards, I was curious if um, that was maybe Temps because there is visually a lot of similarity between the two shows. It's, it's high drama and... Washington, D.C. is often the centerpiece or focal point at which some of the events occur. And so Washington Monument and the Capitol Building are definite visual hallmarks of both series. And now this um, floating trumpet solo over faster rhythms and string and synthesizer textures is another commonality between the two. So anyway, just wanted to maybe throw that out as a theory that I could be proven wrong, but mm, who knows. So anyway... Homeland and Oz and Total Recall and, of course, the Jurassic Park I've been checking out. So, pretty cool. Um, you going to see that Evil Dead movie, Kevin? Uh, probably not. All right. I'm tempted. I'm very tempted. Heard good things. And, you know, I've talked to a few people who have seen it um, and talked about the score a little bit. And apparently it, ha it has a lot of the same big mm -hmm. choir kind of stuff that the original did, which is sort of a neat throwback, I think. Okay. All right. Well, I will try to check it out this weekend. I'll see if I'm I'm able to. I'm pretty sure that's going to be a solo venture because that's a that's a tough sell, given that most people say the movie's great and it's really gory. So that pretty much makes everybody else say no if I ask them. Yeah. What are you doing this weekend? Do you want to see? It's an acquired <laughs> taste. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I may, but I may try to check it out, and if so, I'll be able to give a little a little um, sound bite about it on the next episode. Um, moving on, I just wanted to throw out some CDs have been out recently. I haven't talked about this in the last couple of podcasts, but it's still worth mentioning because the companies are still putting out good CD reissues or <laughs> expanded versions. And one of them is uh, James Newton Howard's Grand Canyon from 1991, a, a pretty famous or well-known dramatic score that he did to, um, to the film. Also, The Wild Bunch by Jer Jerry Fielding has been put out as a three-CD release by Film Score Monthly. And if I'm not mistaken, that's their final... 250th CD and they're done. They're not doing any more like reissues or oh, uh, cleaned right. up versions. So that's their farewell uh, venture. So uh, it's a, a wild bunch is uh, very quickly. It's just a, a Western that sort of defies a lot of the, the styles of that genre. It's very violent and very not, it, not black and white on the heroes and the villains. And the score is also a, um, sort of a game changer for the style. So no Elmer Bernstein or, and Neil Morricone influences there. Uh, also, two uh, two releases uh, of Jerry Goldsmith scores, uh, The Challenge and The Salamander, are both out now, or one is on pre-order. So um, look into those. There's some samples online. And The Carpetbaggers 
is an older film by Elmer Bernstein. So all these great film composers and decent scores to check out. There's more, but I didn't have time to mention all of them. So if you want to go, I, I mean, I, we don't have anything with ScreenArchives.com. They don't pay us, but it's, I'm just going to put it out there. They're one of the better film sites uh, because they collect all the different companies that do these reissues, and they sell uh, all of the CDs at their one website. So it's, it's a really good company. So check out ScreenArchives.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll put uh, I'll put a link to it in our show. Um, also, Omni Publishing Omni O M N I has recently released uh, this, and I actually have a copy. Again, we don't get it for free. I bought it, but this is the actual full score. Uh, can you hear me? The full score to uh, Danny Elfman's Edward Scissorhands from 1990, and it is 200 and 241 pages. And as you can see, I thought you were gonna you were listing the price for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Two hundred and forty one thousand dollars. Yeah, if just, you order now. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, just to give you an idea. So it's pretty well done. I remember when uh, some friends of ours posted it uh, on Facebook and said, "Check this out." Um, there, it, it got some. It got some Facebook hate right away, like, oh, I don't think the notation looks that good, and I think I'll pass. But this thing is $75, which is normally the price of, like, a couple of movements of a Star Wars movie. And I mean, like, concert arrangement movements. And the Hal Leonard scores really jack the price way up for for the amount of material you actually get. So this is a steal at $75. So anybody who's interested in the film music orchestration – And unfortunately, it doesn't have timings. So there's no cue timings or references to what the music lines up with visually. But as I was pointing out, you do get the cue titles. So like this one, the paper dolls, you can actually see that it's got the it's got the 4M4, which is the original designation of, you know, the cue number and then what reel of the film it's assigned to. So um, so definitely check it out. It's got a little a quick little interview with Elfman at the beginning where he reflects on some different aspects of the score, as well as a list of all the instrumentation. Uh, but very cool, and obviously some time has been put into this, so if, if you care at all and want to study a little bit about film music, check that out. It's very cool. And also I mentioned earlier, this could change a lot of things because Hal Leonard has only been putting out these concert suites, but here you can actually study cue by cue the entire film score. And if this catches on, which I want it to, and Kevin, I'm sure you want it to. Sure. Yeah. Um, then this could spell like a new direction because they could hire more people to do these jobs and go ahead and, and produce these scores. And then you could get maybe like full John Williams or Jerry Goldsmith or da- uh, other Danny Elfman, who knows, uh, James Horner, Thomas Newman scores, anything. And especially to big movies where the music's in your ears and it's, you know, it's in your memory. And you always, if, if you want to know how to um, see like what the detail went into it, then this would be your chance. So pick it. I would encourage you to pick it up. I'm the publishing. If you're, if you're watching the show, we, we want the 1989 Batman score. So yes, Omni. You can get on that next. That'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> this is, and, and I should also say Omni's made the cover of it look identical to the 1990, uh, soundtrack CD of the, of the, the kind of lab the, the like pinkish purple exterior around the Edward scissor hands. Mm-hmm. And even, uh, even the font for the Danny Elfman namesake here is exactly like the same font. So it's 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 kind of classy. And for those that ever bought the CD, it's very visually consistent. So yeah. so definitely it wasn't just um, a slapdash thrown together really fast. So um, very and you're right. This it's kind of a big deal. You know, I get um, students and other composers asking, you know, how do you how do you study film music because you can't necessarily go out and buy the scores. And in my there are usually essentially two answers. You can look for concert arrangements like the John Williams signature edition things. Or the other answer is you can look for the scores of the classical composers that influenced a particular score. So, you know, if you want to study the orchestration from star Wars, you can look at Gustav Holst, the planets, and you can look at Stravinsky, right of spring. But this is the first time I've ever seen something that is fully published score of the entire score, not just some kind of concert arrangement. And that's that's really a, a pretty valuable tool. And, and like you said, hopefully this leads to more things like this down the road because yeah. it's a great thing. Yeah. Um, one quick shout out. When I was mentioning CDs, I just want to go back a couple minutes. A uh, friend of the show, Scott Glasgow, 
has a score to the movie Riddle, and his score is now available through Verez Saraband. That the label is pretty well known among film music fans. And again, Riddle, the score by Scott Glasgow, is available at uh, ScreenArchives.com as well as several of the other websites and probably Amazon, I would yeah. guess. It seems so, like the score's been getting some good reviews too, so you should check it out. Yeah, yeah. So um, congrats to Scott for getting a release like that by a nice quality label, which means whatever they're going to put out, it's going to sound really good. So, so congrats on his success with that and check that out if you get a chance. Um, yeah, that's it. So again, with the score, it's very cool. Omni Publishing is doing a brand new thing. So support it if you can. Or ask your local, if you go to college somewhere, ask your music library to get a copy of it so that you can have it as a study score. Or if your local library is is up for that, ask them to do it as well. And I want this to sell for them so they'll be convinced to produce other scores. That's right. Nam- namely the 1989 Batman. That's right. Okay. <laughs> all right. So all right. Anything else you want to mention, Kevin? No, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Okay, so we're going to go see some movies and listen to some scores, and you do the same. And that will do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on <clears throat> the soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to the show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And before we go, here's a little bit of unreleased music from the original Jurassic Mm. Park score. It may or may not be on that fancy CD we told you about. We don't know. But here it is. Enjoy. And we'll see you next time.